You know, when I read the, uh, the translation of the prequel to this, uh, Hymns of Blood, at the end of that book, the book suddenly stops and I called Navdeep and I said, how can you do this? I mean, where's the rest of this? Why do I have to wait for a whole another year while you sit and translate the next book? Because the story was so gripping. So any of you who like what you're hearing today, I would suggest that when you buy this book that's being released, you also buy the prequel. And I hope that the bookshop has hymns of blood as well. And read both. You have to start with the earlier journey and see it all the way through. Absolutely delighted that Navdeep has brought to life his grandfather's work, Nanak Singh, one of the great uh, uh, writers of the Punjab. He's seen to be the greatest writer of Punjab. And people like us who have no access to Gurmukhi or Punjabi uh, never got to read the stories till Navdeep started translating uh, by accident, I think, in some, some purpose, his first book, uh, Pavitra Papi, and thereafter, all of these other books. So thank you, Navdeep, for bringing this to life. Thank you, Urvashi, for being here, and we'll release the book first. Thanks so much. Thanks, Anjoy, for that really nice release. Hi, everyone. Hope you've had your lunch, because we're going to have a nice conversation about the book. So, Navdeep, congratulations. This is number, how many? Number five. So, Navdeep has been translating his grandfather's works for a while. This is number five. His grandfather wrote 59 books, uh, of which 30 are novels, right? So, 38 uh, novels. <laughs> 28 novels. 38. 38. Okay. So you've got uh, a long way to go to do those. But okay, Navdeep. So let's start. Um, I want to start by asking you, uh, you've known of your grandfather's work, and there is a huge amount over there. But you've only started translating recently, right? So what was it that led you to actually think of translating his works and... What were the choices you made? Why did you make the choices that you made? So I think uh, the journey started really with a lot of pressure from my mother, as these journeys often do, right? Mm -hmm. um, she was um, a professor of Punjabi language literature herself in uh, Khalsa College for Women in Amritsar. Mm -hmm. And she would say that not just because Nanak Singh was my father-in-law, but when I teach literature, I find that he was a genius of a storyteller. And if he had been writing in a language other than Punjabi, he would have had a much larger international following, perhaps, uh, rather than be pigeonholed to those who can read Gurmukhi script, which is a very finite universe. Um, so, so she said, look, you're the only one in the family whose English is halfway decent. Uh, so you have an obligation, a responsibility to try and uh, t take this up. Um, so the first book I chose was Pavitra Papi because it is a story that I was very familiar with. I'd seen the film. I read the book several times during my childhood. I, it was part of um, a high school curriculum. But the most, uh, I think, important reason for me uh, to choose Pavitra Papi and then Adkhidya Full, which was translated as a life incomplete, was that these books were set in a largely urban Punjab setting. Mm -hmm. And I was much more comfortable dealing with the idiom yeah. uh, for urban Punjab. Uh, I tried my hand in between to translate his uh, seminal novel, Chitalahu. Mm -hmm. uh, but that is so rooted in the soil of Punjab mm -hmm that I found myself unable to the task. And I thought, you know, I'll be uh, doing se some serious damage to the book. Yeah. Um, the third I picked was Khuni Visakhi, which is the long poem that he wrote after surviving the Jallianwala Bagh massacre. And that was dictated more by the fact that the centenary of the Jallianwala Bagh uh, was coming up. And we said, this would be a, an important project to take up. And in a sense, that led me to the, these two novels, which are on the partition, because 
I thought while we are going about celebrating 75 years of independence, it's also important to remember the sacrifices that were made uh, by a different generation at that time. And, and, and so, yes, celebrate, but also don't forget what happened. So, Navdeep, before we go on to talk about these two novels, and in particular about uh, Game of Fire, which we are launching today, uh, I want to ask you one other thing, that you knew your grandfather as your grandfather, the Bauji in the family, and as a somewhat benevolent, somewhat patriarchal, somewhat authoritarian man. What was it like for you to discover the writer in him? Um, I think this process of translation, particularly the last three, Khuni Visakhi and these two novels, um, gave me an insight into his character that I previously perhaps lacked. Because look, our childhood memories, he passed on when I was 12. Mm. Uh, and, and, and so, uh, you know, what you're aware of is either images as a kid, some memories, and some things that you heard. Translating these has made me much more aware of him as a, not just as a leading public intellectual of his time, but his sheer courage, integrity, uh, intellectually, mm -hmm. to uh, say what he believes in. His staunch nationalism, I mean, it's like he says, every poor breeds from other India. Mm -hmm. um, Bharat Mata, as he keeps saying again and again, and yet, his uncompromising secularism. Mm. Uh, he is just not willing to concede any uh, uh, ground mm. on that. Um, we created a little Nanak Singh Center in the Gurunayak University Library last year. Mm. And when we were looking for interesting stuff to put up, mm. there's this thing in his own handwriting, which I'll first say in Punjabi. He says, Nanak Singh, Janam to Punjabi hai. Karam to Bharti hai, Taram to Manav Puji hai. Right? Nanak Singh is a Punjabi by birth. He's an Indian by choice. Uh, and he is a humanist uh, in his creed. And, and that's something that he, it comes through consistently, particularly in these two books, when you see the kind of atmosphere in which he was living. Um, for a writer in 1947, for a book being published in 1948, to take the kind of objective view of uh, developments that he's seeing uh, is, is quite remarkable. And many of us were familiar through friends and family of the partition story that we had heard, which was about the atrocities committed by the Muslims on the Hindus and Sikhs who uh, moved across. In this book, he also forces us to know that we were no laggards when it came to atrocities. You know, uh, uh, the, 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 there was as much violence perpetrated by the Sikhs and Hindus on the Muslims uh, as, as the other way around. And that's a story that we, we haven't registered quite in our, in our consciousness. So when I was doing some research for this book and that period broadly, the things that came to me as a surprise, you know, according to the 1941 census, which was the last one before independence, Amritsar district had a 46% Muslim population. We grew up in the 1960s in a city where there were virtually none. Growing up as a child in Amritsar, the only Muslims that I remember uh, were the uh, Kabuliwalas coming with the dry fruits or the Kashmiris coming with the shawls and, and other stuff. But the local population had been decimated to a point that it was almost non-existent. Um, we never heard about, everybody talked about Harbandar Sahib, the Golden Temple, and Durgyana Mandir, uh, but where was the great mosque of Amritsar? Uh, and, and so it's, it's almost, you know, so his, this process of translation, I think, forces you to revisit that period of your history from a different perspective. So you've said many things, and there are a lot of threads I want to pick up on in that. Let me start uh, with the first. So for those of you who have not read uh, Game of Fire, and I would uh, suggest all of you read it, uh, as Navdeep says, the novel is centered in Amritsar in 1947. 
and it talks about the violence that took place in Punjab in March of 1947, and then subsequently, of course, in August, because in the Punjab it started early in March for various reasons. And uh, this, the perspective that he takes through the book is, is a kind of steadfast refusal to say that it was the violence was perpetrated only by one community. It is everybody who is at some level implicated in it uh, and who needs to recognize their kind of role in it. But the book does not also shy away from some very disturbing uh, descriptions of the actual violence that happened, which uh, according to what Navdeep has said and what he's read in the, uh, the autobiography, his grandfather's autobiography, was based, uh, many of these incidents were based on things he had actually seen, bloodshed and murders and so on that he had actually seen. So I'm struck by a few things, Navdeep, which is one is in Punjab and in Punjabi and Hindi and a bit in English, there has been some writing on partition, fiction on partition. But uh, hardly anyone has written so immediately. You know, he saw it in 47, the book is out by February of 48, you're saying. The next book is out by August of 48. How did the writer in him get the distance to do this? What, what did it do to his psyche? So, you know, he writes in his autobiography, uh, which was published in 1949, that he was so traumatized by the violence that he saw and his inability to do anything to stem the tide of violence that he went into deep depression. Um, and, um, uh, you know, he, he speaks about his uh, wife, uh, our grandmother, being extremely concerned. He's visiting doctors, uh, being subjected to injections and all of that. And nothing helps. And then my grandmother tells him, listen, when you were younger, you used to read the scriptures. You used to read Guru Granth Sahib. Why don't you try and get back into that habit? And he does that and he finds comfort. Um, and and, and uh, in a few weeks, he says that he has healed enough that he wants to put everything that was in his head bubbling away on paper. And, 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 and so he pretty much wrote these two books uh, at, at, at one go, as we can see it. Um, and, 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 and perhaps that was a form of catharsis for him to, to put everything down as he had seen it. And he says um, very powerfully in the in, in the foreword uh, of Hymns in Blood, that he says, uh, people know me as a writer of fiction, uh, but I have to tell you this, that what I'm writing now uh, should be seen as a historical narrative. Yes, uh, the characters may be fictitious, uh, but the events are real, and all of these events that I describe are either events that I've seen firsthand with my own eyes, or events about which I've heard from people that I, uh, um, who, who experienced this themselves. So he, to me, the importance of these books, and he, and, and he just goes on to say, he says, people will question some later on, why is Nanak Singh writing history or historical fiction? He's not a historian. There are many better qualified historians around us. But I'm afraid that with the passage of time, People who write on this period will write pinched by their religious or other perspective. And I want to write it as I saw it. And I, you know, it's almost his desire. So he doesn't want the distance of time. He wants to put out his emotions, then they're raw, naked, as he saw them. There's also something quite beautiful in a deeply secular man, as you describe him taking solace in religion. So he read the Guru Granth Sahib, he felt healed by it. So there's something quite lovely in that. But I also want you to talk about another thing. In his works, the women characters are really, really quite strong, which is very unusual. Um, and here it is Krishna or Naseem is the central character. Can you tell us a bit about her and can you read a little bit from the book which describes maybe something to do with Naseem's so, you know, uh, the book has two um, very strong characters. There's Satnam, who I suspect is semi-autobiographical in the sense that there are some incidents in the book 
which we can correlate either with my grandfather's autobiography or with stories that we'd heard from my father uh, in, in the family about his unsuccessfully trying to rescue some people, actually rescuing a group of women and children uh, and taking them to a hospital and that, all of that. So there's Satnam, who uh, uh, is idealistic to the point that he sets up a unity council so that he can foster some kind of amity between the different religions while they are at each other's uh, throats. And then there's uh, Naseem, who, uh, you know, uh, is sort of uh, brought forward from the last, uh, last novel. Um, and, and she joins his, uh, his unity council. And at a time when Satnam himself is in the throes of a dilemma, um, isn't sure whether the path he's pursuing is right, um, shouldn't he also join those who are seeking retribution uh, um, from the Muslims? This girl influences him with the clarity of her thought, and he influences uh, a group of people who are out to carry out a major arson and, um, and bombing campaign. So we have this passage where she um, uh, is addressing this group of 12 persons who are um, out to create mayhem uh, and says, my dear brothers, think carefully about this. Think about who you were and what you've become. Wherever you look today, you see signs of death and destruction. The spires of temples, the domes of gurdwaras, the minarets of mosques, all are being raised to the ground. Sacred memorials and tombs are being vandalized. The holy pages of the Vedas, the Gurguran Sahab, and the Quran are being used as waste paper. People are desecrating the ruins of places of worship by converting them to toilets and urinals. And those that have survived are being converted into bomb factories and arsenals that can add to the carnage. Are these the new symbols of your religious adherence, the faith that you repose in your God? Alas, how I wish you could take a step back to look at the bigger picture. Again, I'm not disregarding the slaughter of so many of my brothers in Potohar and in the frontier province nor the dishonor to which so many of my young sisters have been subjected. But are you going to hold innocent children responsible for their actions? Children who are entirely oblivious of your religious fervor and communal hatred? I would have been pleased if you had fought like men, organized yourself into a force that attacks the Muslim mobs and makes them pay for the havoc they wrought. But where's the manliness in the attack that you are planning for Wednesday? an attack that would be carried out in the dead of the night against unarmed and peaceful people, an attack where you would hurl bombs that would target, maim, and kill women, and the infants that they are nursing with their breasts, the old, the infirm, and the children who haven't even felt the earth of these lanes and by-lanes under their tender feet. Is that your sense of responsibility? Does your religion allow you to attack the young and old, women and the infirm? Can you tell me if any religion allows this? It's kind of got shades of what's happening in Gaza and elsewhere. I yes. think that message is as relevant today uh, uh, as it was 75, 80 years back when it was written. That's interesting you say that. So you actually, you are one of the few people who has experience of that region. Uh, you were ambassador in Egypt. You speak Arabic. Do you want to say a little more about the way in which it resonates with what's going on in Gaza? I think when you see um, whether what Hamas did in terms of the uh, terrorist attack that they perpetrated on the 7th of October, killing some 1,200 innocent um, Israelis, uh, many of them women and children, the fact that they kidnapped and took away 240 um, hostages, again, many women and children among them, non-combatants in any, every sense of the term. And then you, when you look at Israel's response, uh, which is completely disproportionate and you know beyond the pale of any uh, norm of international law, you are reminded that the savagery to which we can be driven when we other the other side, uh, it, it's almost a way of dehumanizing the other side. And that process of dehumanizing the other almost becomes an enabler to carry out acts of violence and brutality that you wouldn't under normal circumstances. 
Yeah, thank you for that, Navdeep. We, uh, we will open it up to questions in a minute or so. There is one other strand that I want to ask you about, and I want to ask you to read another little bit, but that strand is when you were reading that passage, uh, which uh, Naseem or Krishna speaks out in this meeting, the interesting thing is it's a meeting where people are primed up to go and commit violence, and they have collected all the arsenal of weapons and gunpowder and stuff that they need. And this woman, who is actually a, a Muslim woman, and who reveals her Muslim identity, is giving them this lecture. And they actually listen to her. That's also what was so surprising. And I want to take this to lead you to another woman. That is, your grandfather was such a well-known public intellectual, writer, a thinker. He recorded that time. He gave us that history. What about the woman behind that, your grandmother? Well, you know, they married very young. Um, or my grandmother was very young. She was only 17 when they married. Um, but she was a pillar of support. And he writes in many places that, uh, you know, she was the rock on which his whole edifice was built. Mm. Um, and um, uh, she outlived him by a good 20 years. Uh, and, and, and so we had the, actually the privilege of uh, getting to know her much better uh, than uh, knowing my grandfather. And, and, and she was this really amazing character. Um, I think she died at the age of 98 or something. And till the end, her mind was razor sharp. Um, we used to have a joke in the family that sit with the Pabiji and you will get a rundown on whatever is happening in the extended family, in your cousins and their kids, and who's uh, happy and who's unhappy and all of that. Uh, and a very strong woman. And, and, and in fact, uh, you know, some of that is reflected in the number of novels that my grandfather wrote. And, it, you know, you, you were talking about female characters in his novels. My mother's pe uh, uh, master's dissertation was actually on the, on, on the female characters of Nanak Singh's novels. And she, she writes at some length. And, and Bauji himself, my grandfather, writes. He said, you know, when I, in my younger days when I was writing books, I wanted to show empathy towards women, and I had these characters, but why did I have to kill them in the end? Why did they have to become victims of the injustice of society? Uh, and, 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 and now that I've thought about it, I want my women to be strong, I want them to battle, and I want them to win. Uh, and, and so in his later books, um, the women characters are more feisty, um, and, and uh, they are willing to uh, confront uh, rather than submit to the, uh, the ills that they see. Okay, so we have to read those two. There's one point that Navdeep makes, which um, I'm not going to ask him to speak about, I'm just going to tell you about it. Very interesting to go back to uh, what he was saying about how at partition Amritsar was emptied out of its Muslim population, which is something that happened pretty much across the Punjab. So there are very few Muslims in Punjab other than, say, in Malir Kotla or something. but. Navdeep makes this very interesting point about how now Amritsar is changing with migrants who are coming, Muslim migrants who are coming in from different places and who are now reconstituting the Muslim population there. And uh, in that context, you talked about how the masjid also came alive um, at some point when uh, last year or, or whenever, when you were translating this book. So that's also interesting how the demographic is, uh, is changing. But I don't want you to talk about that. Uh, because we are running out of time. I want you to close, if you would, with a short reading again, and then we'll take some questions. So, okay, this is probably controversial, um, but, um, you know, my grandfather says this in, both in his foreword and then he brings it out through uh, a passage in the book, that he um, had yearned, or India, he had yearned for India's independence, and, and the country had been enslaved for 200 years. But when 1947, 15th August came, what was the mood? And I'll just read this small section. 15th August, the date that had been etched into our consciousness over the last few months, was now just two days away. It was said that 15th August would bring an end to the servitude endured by Indians after almost two centuries of British rule. It would usher in a new dawn one where Indians would finally be independent. It would mark the transition of power from the British to Indians themselves. Some were even speaking of the magnanimity of the Angres, 
citing the decision to advance the date of their departure by some months from June 1948 uh, that they had promised to August 1947. Both the provincial governments and the union government were making extensive celebrations to celebrate this historic day in a befitting manner. The excitement in provinces like UP and Madras had already reached a fever pitch. And he goes on to describe how the mood in Punjab was in stark uh, contrast. And he says, our head spins in wonder as we step back and look at the enthusiasm and energy with which these celebrations are being planned. Martial law is to be imposed in 11 districts of Punjab and other arrangements are being put in place to make sure that nothing unpleasant happens when the limbs of Mother India are being hacked. Leading members of our community, meanwhile, are sharpening the spears of Hindu Mahasabha and direct action because they feel that the Congress High Command has been unjust to them, that they have received a smaller piece of Mother India's body than they expected. The Sikhs are convulsing with their own anger over the division, complaining that the large and fleshy thigh from the leg that was Punjab has gone to Pakistan, while they were left with just the spindly calf. The Muslim League, to be sure, had some reason to rejoice over the part that they had received, but they viewed the celebrations with the jaundiced look of one who's observing a wedding at his enemy's home. How did the jubilant songs of independence sound to those ears which were still ringing with the haunting cries of thousands of innocent victims, whose eardrums had become accustomed to the loud reports of gunshots and the deafening boom of exploding bombs? For them, the joyful tunes were like hymns in blood. The celebrations were like a game of fire. Thank you so much, Navdeep. We just have five minutes. Does anyone have a question or a comment? Please. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir, for this wonderful session. Uh, I particularly enjoyed this session because this is uh, my area of uh, interest. I'm doing research in women and partition and read all of ma'am's book. So my question is, as you said that uh, uh, you have yourself witnessed some of the events, uh, you know, during that. So is there any particular character who uh, resonates your own personality? from that book? Well, not mine, but my grandfather's, I presume. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, no, no, you can go ahead. I thought if there's another question, we can take both together. So that's what I, uh, if, is there anyone? Yeah, please. Nanak Singh's book, all of them had very strong women characters, but the early women got annihilated and the latter women survived. Stronger and survivors also. Now I want to ask is, was it, due to the fact that India was changing at that pace, or was it that he wished it to change at that? Does, do his books give any peep into that? So, you know, um, what Bauji used to do was, he, right through many of his books, he had one idealistic, altruistic, larger-than-life character who appears as in one form or of another. And he writes in his autobiography that when he was 14 or 15 and he was a fairly wavered young man in Peshawar, he came under the influence of a, 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 a Sikh priest in a Gurdwara over there. He had been born as a Hindu. His name was Hansraj when he was growing up in, in, in a Hindu family. Under this man's influence and guidance, who, and this man really became a mentor for him, he converted to Sikhism. And so, at, and, and he, he narrates how during the Spanish flu in 1916-17, when large parts of the population were being de devastated, how this man brought relief and all. So, for him, one is this person appears. So, in this, these books, it's Baba Panesha, who is this erudite scholar, who is very gentle, gracious, who to him is a representation of Gyani Bhag Singh, who was his, his, his mentor. Um, and then he creates characters after his own self. You know, when you hear Satnam and Naseem speaking in the book, you can hear his thoughts being articulated through those characters. Uh, and, and, and it's quite uh, uh, significant how 
he uses his characters and their words to influence your opinions because he saw himself as a social reformist. And that's on your question, ma'am, that he writes in his autobiography that, why do I write? And he talks about the influence of Munshi Premchand on him when he was in his 20s. Uh, and, and how he thought that writers have an obligation to use their words and, uh, and thoughts to try and reform society. Uh, and, and, and so the role of women in his novels clearly reflects an, an evolution of his own personality over a period of time. And his realization that I'm, I think I'm doing something for the women, but actually I'm showing them as victims. Pavitra Papi, for example, uh, Veena dies in the end. Uh, um, of unrequited love and all of that, so. Okay, it looks like I made a mistake because now there's a thing telling me we have nine minutes. So I think I was counting our earlier minutes as, as the minutes of the beginning. So, no, but is there, uh, yeah, there is somebody there with the question, so. Hello, that was, uh, it's been a really interesting discussion. My question is, uh, given the kind of very difficult experiences that he went through, what uh, kept him going in his secular views? You know, uh, uh, everything around him would have prompted him to uh, think otherwise. But it was something that kept him going. What was that? I think, you know, he... He had an interesting evolution in literature um, when he um, was 16, 17, 18, growing up in Peshawar. He discovered he had a penchant for poetry and music. And then when he converted to Sikhism at the age of 17, um, you know, everybody talks of the zeal of the new convert, uh, of the recent convert. So his first the thing was he wrote a, a, a book of poems um, or hymns in praise of the Sikh gurus. And that became a runaway bestseller and it was really his financial sustenance for many years. At that time, he was known as Nanak Singh Kavishar. Uh, and and, and he, so he was making a reputation as a poet. Uh, and, and he wrote Khuni Visakhi after surviving the Jallianwala Bagh massacre. He participated in the Guru Ka Bagh Morsha to liberate the Sikh Gurdwaras from the British control and went to jail and wrote a poem called Zakhmi Dil. Uh, which was also confiscated and banned by the British. Um, and it's a pure coincidence that he's in jail in Lahore in 1922, uh, and he, uh, there's a fellow prisoner who's been able to bring in a large number of Munshi Premchand's novels. And he starts reading them. And he says, this is my calling in life. This is what I want to do. And then despite everything that, he, that you, 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 you mentioned, he just stuck to it uh, from 1923 till his passing in 1971. He pretty much wrote a book a year um, and, and has left us this enormous corpus of work, uh, which uh, uh, not only documents Punjabi culture, society, and so on, but also the major events uh, that he witnessed uh, across that period. In fact, his last book, um, uh, which was published a little before he died, was on the 1965 war. Uh, between India and Pakistan. So history really did fascinate him. Okay, do we have another question? Yeah. Uh, thank you for the book first, because it is, it is talking of wounds which are probably still uh, not talked about and rightly said silence about it. And now that they've been talked about, probably the wounds are you know, getting alive again. But probably uh, the society and the nation needs closure. How do we reach that stage? Because right now we have only come to a first stage of acceptance of something that happened, which was not talked about much, we are talking about it. How do we take the next step? So I think, I think uh, acknowledgement of what happened, awareness of what happened, is a pretty good starting point. You know, um, to, to to understand what 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 transpired. Um, my own sense is that Punjab itself, which probably suffered the biggest trauma of the partition is closer to healing than some of the other parts of the country. Uh, you know, in Punjab, there's a, almost a willingness to move on. Um, and that might be reflective of the character of the people, uh, the history that they've accumulated over the centuries of, of, of different kinds of uh, invasions, different kinds of traumas. Uh, but, you know, in Punjab, paradoxically, 
there's a much greater willingness to establish, say, peace with Pakistan and trade and normal relations with Pakistan than in some places further away. Um, so so it, it, it seems paradoxical at, at some point that the, there's a less visceral um, um, reaction in Punjab uh, than in communities further away. In fact, do um, you wanted to ask another question? You're raising your hand. No, you have to do it into the mic because we can't hear you otherwise. Things first thing about Punjab being more willing to reconcile is because the cultural similarity between the Punjab and the uh, Pakistan, uh, uh, Punjabis in Pakistan and India is so strong that I'm sure they pine for some of the things more than other communities do. That's what I feel. Second thing about, uh, I forgot now what I was going to say. Ah, yes, in continuation with the question that ma'am asked, uh, what kept him so secular? Can you tell us about some of the other influences apart from Prem Singh and uh, Prem Chand and Sikhism? Were there any other uh, psychological, uh, ideological, psychological or influences which made him such a strong secular person? Is there a mention of that? You know, he, he, he actually goes into what our scriptures say. And, and, and there's a passage in this book uh, where Satnam is uh, having a lot of doubt about what path he should take. And again, as I said, Satnam is sort of semi-autobiographical in this, in, 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 to this extent, that he, after struggling with his demons, and he's never prayed in his life, even though he's uh, born into a devout family and all that, he's never prayed, but he goes to his mother and says, can you give me the small gutka? Uh, um, and I want to, uh, uh, want to look at it. And he starts praying, and then he closes his eyes, and he sees images of Prophet Muhammad, and of Jesus, and of Guru Nanak, and of uh, Sant Kabir. And he says, hey, they all look the same. Mm. Um, and, and, and I think the point that my grandfather is trying to make is that, in the essence, none of the scriptures is really teaching you violence. It's our interpretations that are uh, the, the root cause of the problem. And, and he keeps quoting... Guru Gobind Singh, Manas ki jat sab ke pehchan bo, that humanity, uh, mankind is a single creed of humanity. Uh, and, 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 and his constant sort of refrain is, I am a devout Sikh, but if you ask me which is more important for me, my religion or my humanity, it's my humanity. Well, I think that's a good note on which to close. Um, Navdeep, thank you, because see, one of the things that you've done in responding to the question about what can we do, pointing to the need to acknowledge uh, what has happened in the past and to acknowledge it really with full knowledge of our own complicity, not to say the violence only happened from there, the other side, but how so many of us and our families participated in it in one way or the other. And to say there were no good guys or bad guys in this, but everybody fell into that. We have to find a way out of it. And I think unless we do that, we are not going to move ahead from here. And if this has started happening in Punjab, well, we Punjabis have often shown the way, no? So it's maybe something that should happen <laughs> elsewhere as well. But, but also, Urushi, uh, one of the messages that comes through from this book in particular is beware of... Uh, political leaders who stir up religious passions, beware of the media, which, uh, 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 which blows up stories and, and, and ex exaggerates and, and, and uh, uh, fans the flames. Uh, and, and there are messages that in the book that are um, relevant for our times. So true today. Mm -hmm. Thank you all very much for listening. Navdeep's book is available and he will be signing it. So please do pick up copies. And as Sanjoy said, pick up copies of the earlier book also. Thank you, Rishi. Thank you. Oh, they're not going to